Greetings, Kerbonauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number three of Project Odyssey. And at the end of the second episode, we left off with our geosynchronous or geosynchronous satellite trying to get itself into its final orbit. We are roughly in the proper orbit and roughly at the proper inclination, but it's not perfect in either of those. So right now we are waiting for our mission control to come up underneath the satellite. And it's really hard to see right there, but if we go really fast like this, you can see that the planet is slowly moving closer. And I think I'm beginning to see Africa. Of course, that's not really Africa, right? It can't possibly be because this isn't Earth, it's Kerbin. But yeah, it's Africa. Anyway, it's coming up under the satellite, which means now we are directly above it. And I want to make my maneuver to bring that apoapsis down to where it belongs. Now, if you look in that window, last time I showed you the orbital period, we want that to be about exactly six hours. If the planet rotates at six hours and we rotate at six hours, we will stay directly over mission control the whole, whole time. And you remember Curbulator back when I was using that in Project Gateway? And I set up that orbital period calculator. So I decided to give it a try and compare the results of my calculation with the results of MechJeb's calculation. And notice MechJeb says six hours, but my calculation shows that we're still going a little bit slower than that. It's taking us a bit longer. Now this is using data that's coming straight out of the game. It's internal data. So I'm not quite sure what MechJeb is doing to get its data, but since it's not matching up with mine, I decide to go with mine and we'll see what happens. Next up, right above that orbital period, you see the inclination is actually still just a little bit off. It's not a big deal because it's not like we're going to need to have that in exactly the same spot. The radar dishes down on Kerbin aren't pointing up at a particular location in the sky or anything like that. But I do want to get it down to about zero just because that's where I'd like to have it. No other real reason. And then because we'd made that change, that actually threw off our uh, orbital period just a tiny bit. Bit. So we'll do one last maneuver using Curbulator to calculate where we are, get that back where it belongs, and then we'll see if that drifts over time. And if it does, then we'll know that it's wrong. Or if it doesn't, then we'll know that MechJeb is wrong. Now the next thing I need to do here is switch over to the 0.23.5 mod. Well, not really mod, but it's for my mod, the uh, version of KSP, because I need to check on my simple part filter. Somebody reported that this module window here uh, wasn't showing up all of their things. In fact, when they would try to open this, it would lock things up because there was some sort of reference to a negative one index or I don't know exactly what. Uh, but I changed how it's grabbing the part module names in here and hopefully that will fix the bug for the guy. So uh, this looks good for me. It's sorting things still and moving. Yeah, it's sorting things. It's able to take out all the different mods here and put them back in one at a time. So that's looking right. We'll double check that. Yeah, that's looking right to me. So, so this quick break from Project Odyssey is over. I will put this simple part filter back out there on the internets and people can download that filter and hopefully it'll work in 2.3.5. And with that DLL mod change out of the way, we can get back to doing my next launch, which is the Tedris C2. So I'm selecting the target of the Tedris C1 that's already up there because in my MechJeb window, I keep that little thing in the bottom of that window where it says relative inclination. That'll allow me by keeping track of that and how far off I am from the other one, since I know the other one I already put at uh, a zero inclination, then if I can match it up, then that means this one's going to be at a zero. But then I notice, hey, look, my heat, look at the heat down there. It's way too high. So what's going on with this? Did I change something? Do I have a mistake? So I grab that debug window and I take a scroll down in there trying to find the part that is the engine that's currently overheating because it doesn't make sense why that would be overheating. I go in there and I take a look and I see that it has a heat modifier of 319, which doesn't seem really unreasonable to me. So then what I do is I look and I find, oh, it's the uh, maximum heat value of the engine itself. 
A real engine is supposed to be able to go up to like 3200 degrees. In fact, the hotter the better. They work better when they're hot. And so I need to go back in and make a modification here and, and pop that thing back up into a reasonable engine temperature. So now we get to relaunch. I've got the engine max temperature set up to 3200 like a real rocket motor might be. And we've got our target set like we did last time and we're keeping an eye on this window, right clicking on that engine to look at its current temperature and it gets itself up to about 2600 degrees Celsius and then just kind of levels out there. It has a little bit of overheating showing but it's not climbing anymore, it's staying right there. So I think that's gonna be pretty good now. We're gonna leave it like this. But we have a new problem, Houston. I had my eye off the ball. I wasn't watching where I was going and I drifted off of my vector and now we're flipping out. But this isn't the first time I've flipped out a rocket. We can get this back on track, I'm sure, right? No problem, watch this. Now, obviously, when you're trying to get your rocket back on track, anytime it's prograde, that's a good thing. So you fire up your engines and you fire them toward the prograde marker. And then, it, or if you're going up, up is always good because more altitude, like right here, more altitude is going to up um, uh, bring up my apoapsis, which will give me more time to recover. And then if I'm going the wrong way, I throttle the engines down and throttle them back up again if I can manage to flip myself back toward that prograde vector. However, I'm getting a little concerned about how long this is actually taking. And it's very hard to stay on target there and we run out of fuel and now I'm really concerned. Also, notice the fairing. We've got our payload kind of hanging through the side of the fairing just a little bit right there and that's definitely concerning as well. So uh, just keeping with that same strategy though, anytime we're over in the sort of prograde direction, we're going to burn the engines and, and anytime we're going straight up isn't so bad either because we still need that altitude. It is rising, we're getting that apple up into the 40 kilometer range here soon where it will be a, a possible for us to remove that fairing. However, it is still taking a very long time and I'm sure we're bleeding off all kinds of delta V into that atmosphere. But now that we get up here high enough, I think it's time to see if we can get that fairing to separate. We're sort of going in the right direction a lot, but not quite enough. At this point, we're probably bringing up our periapsis more than we are raising our apoapsis because we are flying right along that horizon, sometimes below it. And that's going to bring up your periapsis without affecting your apoapsis quite so much. However, we are getting more orbital velocity, although now I look up and I see stage delta V in the MechJab window over there. Vacuum stage delta V is under 500. There is no chance. We're not even anywhere close to a geostationary orbit and it's going to take almost 500 delta V just to circularize up it if we had been up there. So with no chance whatsoever of recovering this one, we're gonna let this go back in and just let it test out deadly re-entry because that's of course what I was trying to do all along. I wasn't really trying to launch. I wanted to test my deadly re-entry stats because, you know, I had changed them a little, yeah. And the third is going up later today. We are optimistic about new snack growth cultures Kessler has been pioneering. We may see progress on those within the month. Terminate log entry. Hello, Bob. Greetings, Krantz. The flight path for Tedris C3 is complete. Valentina has Neil helping... Oh, hi, Joseph. Valentina has Neil helping her get the rocket actually loaded and ready. I overheard your log. Yes, we should be ready later today. Are you sure we need the third? Two will work just fine, right? You heard, Bill. We don't need to clear every single last scrap of orbital debris anymore, but the trade-off is now he wants a backup ready for all critical mission components. The third will act as an orbital spare in case anything happens to C1 or C2. Whoa, Krantz. Check out the new office. Wow, man, this place is pretty nice. Yeah, Neil was right. Redecorating was a good idea. It's invigorating. So, we were just discussing Hello? Is anyone there? What's that? I don't know. Can anyone read me? Hello? Who's talking? This is Hadfield. Is that you, Krantz? Yes, this is Krantz Hadfield. Where are you? Um... I'm on the MUN. MUN? Computer. 
Activate Tidris Remote Camera. Target Mun. Krantz, I don't have any life support other than my suit. Hadfield, I'm sorry. We have nothing within range to reach you. Let me explain. No, that would take too long. Let me sum up. Oh, poor Hadfield. No life support. There's no way he's going to survive up on the moon like that. Oh dear, we're going to have to do something about that and try and figure out what's going on and how he got there. But anyway, we're back launching that other satellite. We need that second satellite up there so that we can have the backside communications on Kerbin and look at those volumetric clouds. Those things are nice. I like that. That's a good change and they don't seem to have any significant impact on my performance at all. So we're getting ourselves up here again. Uh, this time, hopefully all of our settings are correct where nothing is going to explode anywhere along the way. Oh. Uh, where hopefully nothing else is going to explode anywhere along the way and we can get ourselves up there to have that second geo satellite. Uh, I really don't like the way that that RCS kind of goes through the fairing right there. You can see it, but we'll just blow the fairing now that we're up here at 50 kilometers anyway and not worry about it. But still, I wish it wouldn't do that because really all I want it to be doing is using the RCS jets that are down on that Minotaur stage. That's what would really happen on a launch and I don't want to have to go through constantly deactivating anything. Anyway, we're up here and now I'm going to make a little maneuver node that is going to intersect our orbit with the targeted orbit and do a tiny shift on my ascending node there to get it to intercept that orbit as well. That way when I get over here, we'll just get to this uh, node right now, do a tiny, tiny, tiny burn. It's just a few delta V, but by pushing our uh, little ascending node there over to the opposing orbit, that means that when we make our maneuver to actually burn out and extend our periapsis up to the higher altitude, uh, the inclination change that we're going to need in order to get back to zero is going to be almost free. It'll be just a tiny, tiny bit. It wasn't like we were really going to spend much on it anyway, but at least this way, I don't even have to do a second maneuver partway along the way where we change the inclination during the trip. We're doing it right here instead. Okay, so there's one more thing though. What I wanna do is make sure that that periapsis isn't all the way out to meet the opposing orbit. We don't want to actually be going as fast. We wanna be going faster. We wanna be zipping around so that we can move forward on our orbit relative to the orbit of the target satellite. See how close it is up behind us right there? I wanna be practically opposite that, but I wasn't able to easily easily get opposite with an initial launch. Now I suppose I could have if I had gone into some equatorial low orbit, low Kerbin orbit there, but by doing this, I can still get out to where I want to be here. We'll just get it really close like this. And then every time that we go around once in our high orbit satellite, the Tedris C1, the lower one will go a little bit more than once. Now, before we actually do that though, I want to make sure that I don't lose communication. That was the whole reason I didn't go into the low orbit, is I didn't want to have any risk of losing communication. Oh, that's not the right one. Switch. No, I don't want to activate. Okay, there we go. So we're going to set that one up to point to the Tedris 1. Then we'll switch over to the Tedris 1 and point it at Tedris 2. Meanwhile, both of the satellites are going to target one of their big dishes, the longer range ones at Minmus, and their smaller short range dishes at the moon. In fact, here, let me just throw up some awesome programmer artwork here. Nobody could do better than this artwork. It's beautiful. And demonstrate what I'm talking about here with a little diagram. So the basic idea here is you can see the red big blobs there. Those are going to be my Tedris satellites that are in orbit over the red dot on Kerbin in the middle. Then we have uh, the red dot there is able to transmit 
out all over the place using its omnidirectional antennas and everything that are down on the surface, which means that that orbiting satellite directly above mission control is going to be reachable from Kerbin just because it has an omnidirectional antenna on it as well. So that's going to put it in communication with everything you see here in this circle. Now, if we have that one in communication, we can have it communicate with the one that's on the far side of Kerbin over there. And then once it's in communication, we have a nice big circle that it can see, which is then going to leave us with this. You can see where the signal will bounce up from the ground to the other on those green lines ending over there and providing communication in, in that entire yellow area. However, that little purple circle right there, that one is not going to be in communication because it's just slightly out of range of uh, both of those satellites and blocked by Kerbin. But that's okay because that's really down far, uh, really like low near the surface of Kerbin and we're never gonna have anything down there anyway. So two satellites is enough to provide complete coverage of anything I could possibly be launching around Kerbin itself. Now, each of the satellites is also going to be targeting to both the moon and Minus with those satellite dishes. We have the closer 20 megameter one going to the moon, the 50 megameter pointing at Minmus. Those are cones. So what happens is anything that is around moon or Minmus that happens to be pointing back to Kerbin will pick up one of the Tedra satellites in its cone. And with the two cones pointing toward each other, they will be in communication as well. Both of the satellites are doing it, so that provides complete coverage, except once again on the dark side, on the far side of the moon here, and the same thing would be true on Minmus, just a little bit of area there that wouldn't be visible, but otherwise this big huge yellow area is going to be in communication. That purple circle is the one spot that isn't going to show up. If we were to have anything back there, it would go dark. However, later we can solve that simply by sending a few satellites to go orbit around the moon to provide some local communication and get that dark side basically 24 hours a day or six hours a day as the case may be since this is Kerbin after all. So that puts us back out here at our orbit at Tedris C2, which is still way too close to C1. We need to get it moved all the way around, just like in that picture that I just showed you. So now with our orbit lower than C1, as we move around here, you can see that we're moving slightly further ahead, which meant we went over the horizon relative to mission control, and that's why we're now bouncing our signal. Notice that line is getting closer and closer, whoa. What is that? Hold on a second. Oh, that's the debris. The debris is still transmitting? That should have run out of electricity by now. Well, okay, we'll go check on that for a second here. Hold on. Yeah, it's still got some electricity in it. Well, that shouldn't have electricity by now. That should have run out and been just sitting here dead in our graveyard orbit. So I'm just going to let it run until the electricity actually runs out. It must not have been running anything. Uh, it wasn't tracking it or something like that as it wasn't in focus. But by putting it in focus, that lets me run it out of electricity like it should have been. Okay, back to this. We have that line now. It's getting really close to Kerbin. I don't want it to go past because if it gets if it hits Kerbin, obviously it's going to get blocked. So here we are at our peri periapsis then. Why don't we use this one? I think if we go any further, one more time around might be just too much, maybe. So we'll use this one uh, to, well, apoapsis actually, to boost our periapsis back up to meet the opposing orbit. And now we're gonna be moving really slowly further ahead, but still slightly. Once we get to the other side, we boost that side up too, and then we're matched. And at that point, we'll have our perfectly aligned orbital satellites here for that geostationary uh, communications. For a second there, I thought that I still had electricity that I, I needed to transfer over like I did with the other one, but because I was going to be up here for so long, I had the solar panels out and I didn't need to transfer any electricity after all. So we decouple and activate our uh, collision and avoidance maneuver here, which sends it off at a slight angle and gets it going now in its slightly higher orbit than even our Keo stationary, which is now going to put it in its graveyard orbit just like the other Minotaur 
first stage did for the C1. So C2 here, want to make sure that I'm pointing at the sun, keep those solar panels drinking in that juice, and get ourselves over where we still have a little bit of battery left, but we're going to run out soon. So we're going to make sure that we boost the rest of our orbit here up and uh, get that one so it's in a nice high graveyard orbit. And with that out of the way, the one last thing to do would be to run it out of electricity just like we did the other one. That one won't take very long. And then we can come back here and check on our satellite, which is now, check it out, look at that. It is perfectly right along that line. We need to make sure that it's actually at a six hour orbital period. But if we do that, then we'll have it exactly like I was talking about when we were looking at that picture. So we'll just pull up our curbulator here, bring out the orbital period calculator. Since I used the other one, had the same orbital period calculator here. And we'll do the exact same thing, just kind of keep clicking it and waiting until we hit that exactly six hour point there with the 21600 seconds, and then we'll be done. Reach out my glove and touch the stars. Good night, Hadfield. 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 I want to know what happened. How did Hadfield end up on Mun? He came through a wormhole just like us. But he appeared at Mun instead of Kerbin. How? Well, they're sort of random where they open. They could open anywhere. Could this happen again? Could another Kerbal come through anywhere in one of these? Yes, sir. I'm afraid so. I thought you said we could predict them now. We can. We just didn't think anyone else would come through since we all arrived together. We thought everyone who was coming was already here, but hundreds of these pop up all the time, all over the place. We'll need to refine the search parameters to narrow down which ones might bring more friends. Well, let's get on it. I will not lose another Kermit in space. Not on my watch. Alrighty, well, it's time to launch our orbital spare geostationary satellite. So let's get out here and select the target of Tedris C1. And does that look like it's off to you? That doesn't look like it's lined up like it was before. Whoa, okay, hold on. The other one has gone behind Carbon. All right, that is definitely not staying in sync. I think we have definitely determined now that uh, the Curbulator does not have the correct orbital periods. And so I'm going to switch over and start using MechJeb for orbital period calculation after all. I don't know why Curbulator can't come up with the right thing, but uh, that, that's definitely not in the right spot right there. We're going to have to move that. We're probably going to have to wait until the uh, third one here gets up. The orbital spare will provide a link that will allow me to communicate through one into three over to two and then get two lined up correctly. But that is going to have to wait until next time because for this one we are done. Next time we will look into starting some rebalance on different manned pods like life support things and stuff we can send Kerbals up there with and we might have to look into an alternate fuel source. But we'll take care of that next time. Until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.